What I'm going to share with you today is literally my entire practice and what I believe in, which is every patient must be given the opportunity to see the best they can and without glasses or contacts. I think it's their birthright. And I don't believe in restricting ophthalmologists into LASIK, cataract, corneal surgeon. We are all vision corrective surgeons. It is our responsibility to take every patient to the best vision outcome, even beyond 2020, if we can. Are we okay with that? And hence, I have a practice where patients come from all over the world. We are blessed with the results I've had. That's why I love to share this, is I don't believe any patient is a complex case. It's just a patient where we have to think through a modality and concept, design a plan for them, and bring them back to perfection with the least amount of surgery. So with that concept, let's begin. The title of this is Converting Not a Candidate into Candidates. So you heard about this word a lot, not a candidate. Not a candidate is an important word of safety where you don't do certain surgery on certain patients, but most of the time it boils down to the doctor not wanting to go beyond a certain suggestion or application and thinking only within the box. So keeping safety as the background always, you got to think of each patient as, okay, you're not a candidate for LASIK, but maybe you're a candidate for PRK, maybe you're a candidate for ICL, maybe you're a candidate for combination of those two technologies. But everybody deserves a surgery that, where you can safely take them to their best vision potential. So not a candidate, the most common reasons you see are ocular surface dysfunction, aberrated cornea, self I call it self-paralyzing diagnosis. If you think about the word keratoconus or LASIK ectasia, it paralyzes the surgeon and decreases all chances of hope. So what I tell the doctor is break it down into Lego pieces. A LASIK ectasia is nothing more than a relatively thin cornea with high keratometry with irregular stigmatism and mostly myopia. Now it becomes so simple. How do you address these pins, I call it, before you go for a strike? So I call that self-paralyzing diagnosis. Then I call it does not make sense cases where you just don't want to think about this. You're busy in your practice and the patient comes in and they have a corneal scar with, uh, let's call it um, RK, cuts in the cornea with uh, a cataract, with high irregular stigmatism. Now you're thinking, oh, that does not make sense case. Well, if you spend five minutes, it's a very simple case. We want to remove the scar from this RK cornea. You want to leave the RK cornea in place because you don't want to do a transplant in these patients. So you remove the scar, make the cornea measurable, and then go after the cataract intelligently with the right lens power. So you see how when you break it down, all cases do make sense. Hence, I say everybody is a candidate. So it's a very provocative statement, but actually I think this should be our mindset. But it's important to have a backbone before we have that mindset. Because you can't be somebody who's advertising and just trying a gimmick or, you know, uh, a circus. You have to be very serious about this. These are people's eyes. So the backbone of our practice, my practice at least, the ethics and safety extremely high. No advertising, fluffs, deals or incentives. So no patient comes to me and they're for any reason other than the fact they've seen or heard about results or it's a personal involvement in wanting them to see. So as long as this is importantly clear, now this statement makes sense. It's a commitment. Obstacle, I say, make it into an opportunity. What are the obstacles of not a candidate cases? Patient. According to me, opportunity must take us to patient must see perfect. Even though you don't guarantee these things, in our mind, we should desire that. So it's very clear. Yes, the patient has to sign informed consent and stuff, realistic expectation, but we should desire for them perfection. Think vision, not surgery. Patient never comes saying, I want surgery. They say, can I see? Break down complex to simple. Plan of action, patient surgeon team, safety ethics expectations again. So all the time I keep talking about these concepts and hence our, our mentality changes. Now the keratograph that we have, which is used with the oculus, is very important because it helps us understand the tear film, the ocular surface dynamics, and then the meibomian gland function, which is very important. All of you know this. As refractive surgeons, including premium cataract surgery, you have to know what's going on in the tear film. So the way I have it in my practice, I use the protocol to our advantage. It's very fast to do. Patients understand, and what I love, at least in the way I practice, I show the patient. Here is your situation. Here is your meibomian glands. Here are the dropout areas. You have meibomian gland disease. You have dry eyes. You have tear film breakdown. 
I need to attack this first. And they get it. I say, I would not take you to surgery because right now you're not nourished. This is not an emergency surgery. Let me get your tear film proper. So I feel the keratograph is a very important part of the spectrum of a refractive surgery. So my bum and gland disease, all of us know that. You pretty much know how it looks. That's all my bum that is stuck in the glands, even in RK cases. You need to correct that before we look at premium cataract surgery or refractive, corneal refractive surgery. Of course, I love to show the patients their own eyes so they understand. And once the patient understands, there's a great side effect. They are your team. Benacam protocol, the reason this technology is very helpful is it shows me everything I want, the cornea, the lens, the anterior segment, the depth, the shape, all in one shot. And again, I show the patient. You came in for cataract, but you see your lens here. It's got an opacity. I know, and plus you're a hyperope of plus three. Even though you're 58, I suggest we go after the lens. Similarly, high myope comes in and you can explain the other aspect to them. You can explain dysfunctional lens syndrome. You can explain ICL. You can explain combinations. So that's very important. Turn to the right directions. When I use these technologies, I can look at things like, which look like keratoconus, but were actually a tear film breakdown. And you can see that now with combining keratograph and penacam. You can see the anterior segment reactions. You can see what can you do. Even though this patient has pellucid marginal degeneration, it is stable. Refraction is stable for the last six, seven years. Patient has a cataract. Guess what? I'm going with a toric lens. The fact that he or she has a pellucid marginal degeneration at this point is just a finding. And you let the patient know, I have found this. Yes, it's less chances of predictability. But in, a, in your heart, you know you can deliver. And why not? But yes, you explain all the concepts of ectasia but you're not touching the cornea. So, very important technology mindset, I call this. Don't look at any technology as a robotic diagnostic event. The technology is not supposed to tell us this patient has keratoconus, this patient has X, Y, Z, and these are the criteria. I don't agree with that. It gives you data. You take the data with your clinical data, make sense out of it. That's our job. So, look at technology for data input, and it's our analysis. Collect and count all the pins, you know, just before bowling. You can't just throw the ball and hope or pray that it lands. You have to first get all your pins, count them, look at them. Now, if you make a mistake, you're having a bad day. But at least find your pins, I say. So in every case that comes to me, therefore, I don't call any case complexes. Pull all the pins, see what, what's wrong with them, and then attack everything. Customize a surgical plan to reach vision at the maximum level without compromise to the best vision potential, in many cases, beyond 2020. As long as we believe that that vision is possible, we will deliver. So corneoplastic, you've read about this stuff. For 16 years, I've been teaching these concepts. Actually, it's a contemporary super specialty where we are all vision corrective surgeons. We know how to do LASIK, cataract, cornea, inside the eye, anterior chamber, change the optics at all levels, and do it in the least interventional way with the maximum vision output. That's all corneoplastic is. It's a mindset of how to do 48 techniques to make people see and 112 combinations. Now, how can you tell any patient you're not a candidate? So the goals of this concept of super specialty is vision beyond 2020, reversing practically any refractive complication, turning patients who are not candidates, scars, irregular, stigmatism, RK into candidates, applying the full spectrum and yet Making sure every surgery we do is topical, meaning with drops, brief, aesthetically pleasing, visually promising. Very important. Cannot plan a surgery that is very highly interventional and you're suturing things and you've got transplants and stuff going on. No, you're not thinking now. You're just doing surgery. So as long as we keep these filters in our brain, the patient gets an elegant outcome, superb experience, and you enjoy the post-op vision rather than just doing surgery. That's the mindset. So cornea, all of us understand now we have six layers thanks to Dr. Dua. So it's six layers here. The eczema laser to me is exactly this. I do not hype any technology in my practice. The eczema laser to me is an extension of my own precision at sub-micron level. If you think of the eczema laser like this, this is a tool you have on your shelf to work and shape any cornea. So let me start with the case so it will show you how mindset is unique. And yet, the procedure is not that difficult. Every eye surgeon, I believe, can do this. 
So here is a patient, 68-year-old gentleman, sent to me after his surgeon did an excellent cataract surgery but missed the keratoconus. So the patient ended up with a hyperopic surprise and astigmatism and anterior corneal scarring in a keratoconic eye. And in addition, his surgeon did a YAD capsulotomy. So now, again, this could be a does not make sense case, right? DNMS. But actually it does. Let's break down the criteria. The criteria here are, here is a man who must see, we are all deciding he's 2020. Yes? I'm always thinking that. You bring me a patient with a spear in his eye, I'm thinking, how do I make him 2020? Until I can make note on my notes that, okay, this guy has no optic nerve. Are we okay? So I'm just sharing with you, it's very important to have attitude that our patients can see. Do not give up without thinking or trying. So in this patient now, here are my pins before I go bowling. He has ended up with hyperopia. He has keratoconus, so he's high keratometry. He has anterior corneal scar. He already has a lens in the eye, which is wrong power. And the bag is open, so I cannot exchange. And he wants to see 2020. So when a surgeon sent him over to me, I look at it this way. I don't go, who did your surgery? What kind of lens is this? What technology they use? Doesn't matter. You see how simple I made this. Now, if you look at all that, here's my plan. The way I can get his anterior corneal scarring is a myopic laser ablation. Are you with me? I'll show you later in the scar concepts. But to do a myopic laser ablation, I first need myopia. He's hyperopic. What will I do? Other option is, yes, I'm very proud of my surgical skills. I remove his lens, do a vitrectomy, suture a lens on the sclera, look like a hero. But what have I done to his vision? Will he ever see 2020? And is the surgery brief, topical, aesthetically amazing, least interventional? So the filters are not correct. So I want to do the surgery, only surgery or stages which are aesthetically pleasing, brief, topical, visually promising, elegant. So now, you see how I made the patient a part of my team. He's angry with his surgeon. He has been sent to me. And his main is, he put the wrong lens and I can't see my life is over. I'm like, no, relax. All I need is to make you myopic. Suddenly the surgeon loses his anger, uh, the patient loses his anger, he sits down and goes, wow, what do you say, doc? I said, I just want to know how I will make you myopic. Now he becomes my team. Doc, how will you make me myopic? I go, here's what I'll do. You already have a lens and it's open bag. But he's high K, so I cannot do laser, right? I'll make him more higher keratometry, which is horrible vision, and I cannot get my scar. So I told him, here's what I'll do. I'm going to put a piggyback lens in you, make you myopic. Piggyback lens, three-minute surgery, topical, brief, everyone agree? Leave his lens in place. So I made him minus two, which is a stigmatism of minus one. Got it? A month later, I came back with a myopic astigmatism laser profile, 2020. Here's the best part. A month later, he emailed me. He's 2015. Uncorrected. And he's now a pilot at 68. Again, this is not rocket science. What am I trying to say here? Think through. Break down the giant into a little snicker eating and box of shots. And then take charge. But the outcome is what should drive you. So very important, the planning. So here you can see the piggyback lens with the peripheral iodectomy I did and then laser. So now continue with the cascade, how do I get here? Corneal scars, if you've seen my work, I call it, I've seen 48 kinds of corneal scars, I've broken them into only three systems. Very simple, two systems. In cornea, meaning the scar becomes part of the cornea, and on cornea, which I'll show you, is out above the Bowman's membrane. So in cornea, scar becomes the normal, becomes a real topography and real refraction. So treat it directly with laser. And you see this in cornea scar, you see the residual scars, but patient is, 2020, 2015. On cornea scar, I call it clown suit topography. It's not real. The scar makes it look all this six diopters astigmatism. It's wrong. When you peel these scars off, you have to do a beautiful Bowman's membrane. You cannot give me a scar that you have seen in your practice that cannot fit into just these two categories, in and on. Cannot give me that. For 21 years, I've seen all this. But I broke it into very simple. In and on. Forget terminology. Forget taking lectures on this. Give me any scar. It has to be in or on. That's it. Simple as that. On, you peel off. In, you go through with laser. Straight. 
So you see the on cornea clarity, straight. Now the same patient I'm showing you of on cornea, eight years later came with cataract. He was 2020, this guy, he's a professor. Eight years later he came back and I took him again from 2020, toric lens straight to. What am I trying to say here? Neither his tolerance nor my desire has decreased over eight years. And how difficult is this surgery? All of you know how to do this. Are we okay? So take this guy now with dense scar, cataract, a professor who was sitting at home retired because he couldn't work. He's now scuba diving all over the world. He keeps sending me pictures every year. He recently went to Egypt. But that is my payback, at least for me. I love it. Because there is no evidence of his problem. It's over. Here's another patient, herpetic corneal scar. Now in this case, she needed cataract surgery. She couldn't afford premium lens or any technology like that. Now, I can go through this. The point is this scar, please, this scar is not measurable. Do not do any eye surgery where you're entering with inaccuracy. You want accuracy. So I did a laser, made her measurable, monofocal lens implant, simple, straight to vision. I'm just sharing with you attitude more than anything else. Here's a patient, Black Hawk Pilot. Excellent surgeon, did his amniotic surgery. He had a conjunctival lesion with stem cell deficiency. They did surgery with amniotic tissue, but left him 2200. Young guy, 38 years old. What would you do? Again, so this is a scar, but it's on cornea. You see the topography? Five diopters astigmatism. That's not real. So they had left some of the amniotic tissue on the cornea. From their point of view, very successful because they cleared the lesion, stem cell deficiency. From my point of view, unacceptable. A Black Hawk pilot is sitting at home with no job. So we basically just peeled this off, did a laser through and through, 2020. Astigmatism 0.4. How difficult is that? So it's a thought process that I want to push into every one of you. Surgery you all can do. It's very simple. So you can see this concept again. And making a Black Hawk pilot go back to 2020 is important. Here's a patient. He had a stem cell disorder with severe granuloma in this area. Again, a brilliant surgeon. A brilliant surgeon did his surgery with AMT. Got him corrected. And this is a professional baseball player. He was a high myope, I think minus eight, minus 10, in both eyes. My point, his cornea was cleared with the amniotic tissue. See this correction? Can everyone see that? Yes? But we are not done yet. When you refract this patient through that scar, amniotic tissue, which is very accurate, that means you can do refractive surgery that is very accurate. So you put an ICL in this case, because cornea is keratoconic with scar. 2025. Other I we did ICL 2015. My point, would you ever think of this as a refractive surgery case? Anybody? No. Because mindset. I want you to please remember, by the time I'm done with you all today, you see anybody even with a dagger in their eye, you think he can see 2020. I'm in his way. That attitude has to be there. So this is that AMT ICL case. You can see the astigmatism of eight diopters, which was false. 0.3 when we pulled off the scar. So when you see that, how the astigmatism is a false denominator based on topography, refraction is the only thing that equals vision. Are we clear, guys, everybody? Yes? Patients come to my institute from all over the planet. Guess who refracts them? You got it. There is nothing else. You can't be a master tailor without knowing how to measure your own suits. Have to, no excuse. Cannot blame machines, please. And that's your pride. That everything you measured and cut and designed and tailored has to look magnificent when that guy or girl walks up to a mirror. Has to, that's our job, we're refractive surgeons. So that concept. Intax planning, everybody, how many of you do intax here for keratoconus? Great. So intax is a great thing for keratoconus. Actually, it's a directional-based surgery that helps you 
shape the cone in the direction you want. And I'll come to when we do lamellar surgery and when we do intacts. So you can see you can actually bring patients to 2020 with a proper planning concept. Again, intacts is a brief, topical, elegant technique, and the patient's done. Asymmetric, topo-guided intacts, very, very important. You always want to go on a steep axis of these patients, but also you hug the cone. In many cases, that may be in between the steep and flat. Hence, there is no formula I like to give you, ever. You'll never get a formula from me. It's art. You want to make sure your patients are getting a design for their vision. There's nothing more gratifying, guys, nothing. Intact post ALK ectasia, only seeing eye of this gentleman. U.S. Army, only seeing eye. He was flown to me. Ectasia, after, you know, ALK was before LASIK many, many years ago. This is his ALK. Ectasia, you can see the fly shells ring here. Put the intact in 10.1 astigmatism to 2.7. Here's the best part now. He was so happy with his 2030 uncorrected vision. He never came back for his laser technique. I still feel I would love to do that to bring him to 2020, 2015, 2010. We are the limitation. We have to believe these patients can see only if we perform and fight that hard. So in tax for ALK, you can see over here, 10 diopter astigmatism down to 2.7. Hence, he was 2030. Once the intact is in, in a patient with uh, keratoconus, you can do laser on top of that for astigmatism. Let me stop for a second. Dr. Galani, laser, we are taught we never do LASIK on uh, uh, keratoconus. Yes, you never do LASIK, but laser for astigmatism. Here's what I tell the patient. You already have braces in your cornea. You're, you're strong now. You're going nowhere. Can I take off 11 microns, please? Eczema laser, Vizex, for example removes the least amount of tissue in astigmatism correction. Everybody know this? And gives you an eight or nine millimeter zone. Gorgeous treatment for keratoconus patients with residual astigmatism. In fact, here's a patient from Maryland, uh, very prestigious university again, did a great intact surgery, left him with 3.7 astigmatism. Do you think I'm happy? No. We do laser, bring him to 0 0.3, 2020, go back home. Everybody agree with this concept now? The intacts are already protecting the cornea. Stigmatism removes the least amount of tissue. Of course, refract, make sure the patient's 20-20. You gave him his life back. So that's another thing, always in your armamentarium. Now, intacts post LASIK ectasia we talked about. Again, astigmatism 7.4 to 0.6. Can you see that? And again, look at the thickness change. Hardly any because you did nothing to the center. LASIK ectasia cases, guys. How many people have sleepless nights about this complication? Pretty scary. Look at it logically. LASIK ectasia to me, let's break it down again, like I said, to a snicker-eating guy in boxer shorts. It's not a giant. It's a relatively thin cornea with high keratometry, with irregular astigmatism and possibly myopia. Can anyone ever challenge my definition? Can any of you? Cannot. So why call it LASIK ectasia and scare yourself first? The minute the surgeon says that the surgeon gets scared, the patient loses hope and it's zero after that. Transplant. Excuse me. I think there is no, no indication for transplant in today's world, especially after what I'll show you. All right? So LASIK ectasia, you can see here. Patients, of course, you know the topography look to this. Various ways of building the cornea. Lamellar techniques. Sutureless and a Barraca's anti-torque uh, eight bite, deep lamellar, posterior techniques in cases of posterior problems. Avoid a PKP, please. There's no room for that today, except there's a through and through opening. There is no room for PKP at all. Now, Dr. Galani, when does lamellar keratoplasty come into play in ectasia? When does intacts come into play? Again, see the logic, and this is my 5S system that I've talked about 18 years ago. Like I said, I don't like to give names to diseases. So that's where the paralysis happens. So the ectasia patient who has a very thin cornea, let's say 200, also has scars and is irregular. It's mobile, meaning changing all the time. Now I want to build the tissue. No point putting intacts because my scar is not addressed and my cornea is still very trampoline and frail. I want to build the tissue. So I'll do a lamellar keratoplasty. 
Again, 11 minute surgery. So brief, topical, aesthetic, please, least intervention. Everyone agree? Those filters everybody clear about? So now what lamellar keratoplasty does is it decreases the keratometry. See the keratometry here, 5863 comes down to 4044. Here's the best part. We don't address astigmatism with LK, do we? You don't. So look at the astigmatism, 4.2, 5.2. That's where intact is amazing. If the patient has a clear cornea with ectasia with over 350 cornea pachymetry, you do an intact, a directional treatment. Move the wild horse, the ectasia up into the center. This case, I want the scar gone. I want to build my tissue up for future laser. I'm going to add tissue, lamellar keratoplasty. Are we okay, everybody? So that's what this does. And you can see the impact immediately, keratometry and things that happen. So that's an anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Now here's a scar. This is something I've been doing for three years. First and foremost, what is the only thing I don't look at in a case of corneal scars? Pardon me. Yes, refraction I look at. What is the only thing I don't look at in a case of corneal scar? The scar. Can I let you digest that sentence? The only thing I don't look at in a case of corneal scar is the scar. I look at it and I go, how can I tame this to make him see? Tame it. I'm going to overpower the scar. And I'm not worried about removing it. How's that concept for all of you? A little bit way out of the box? Try it, please. I have 16 years of patients where you can still see the scar and the patients are 20, 20. It's a mindset. Therefore, you get confident about RK cases. Therefore, you're confident about cases of scars, herpes, RK. All of them can see 20, 20 because the mindset has to be cleared. Never do PTK, wrong concept. Cannot chase the scar and damage the shape. What, what uh, equals vision? Shape. Therefore, we flatten and steepen corneas and correct the astigmatism, right? Correct the shape of the scar cornea and you'll be amazed the patient can see. So, on that concept, what I've done three years ago is I thought, okay, this guy couldn't afford laser. Young guy, he's about uh, 21. Central pseudomonas scar from a contact lens. And what do we do? Cannot afford laser, otherwise that's the way I would go here. So I said, all right, here's what we'll do. I'm thinking of lamella surgery, because the insurance covers and et cetera, et cetera, let's help you. But before I go there, he's a very young kid. He's into sports and everything. I said, here's an idea I have. How about I first put an Intax? And a few things we know optically, when you stretch a scar, it becomes more transparent. Also, Mr. Patient, if the intact doesn't work in doing this, the intact channel is the starting point of malar, malar keratoplasty. How simple is this? Doc, let's do it. Okay. So we did the intacts, and what I did is by stretching his scar, made it more regular. You can see the same scar. I haven't removed anything. We put the intacts on the sides, right? What, what, one more thing we did for this young man, we made his cornea much more stronger by putting in braces. Here he is, he put the intact, the scar is bang in the center, if you can see, nearly full thickness. And if you can see the refraction or the topography, 7.1 astigmatism down to 2.2. Now, forget the numbers too. Just look at the shape. Look at where he was. Look at this. This is purely regular astigmatism. Uh, does everyone agree? If he could afford, I would have done. Laser on top of them, brought him to 20, 20. He's 20, 20, 30 minus without glasses, by the way. Are you okay, everybody? Refractive DSEC. People talk about DSEC, DMEC, PDEC, all of that great techniques. But my question always to every surgeon is, what's the vision? I want emetropia. I don't, I don't care what you did in the OR. I want emetropia. So all these surgeries, when you do, it has to be planned with emetropia. In fact, your confidence is so high once you reach that, is you can do toric lenses in these patients. It's all a matter of us understanding that there are no limits for these patients to see. Here's a patient of epikerophakia. How many of us have seen, I know Dr. Gimbel, you have. How many patients have seen epikerophakia? Everyone knows this surgery? John, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, patients... 
I'm sure Dr. Uh, Irar has seen it. Well, what they used to do at that time is, because these were extremely high myopes or aphakics, this guy was a very high myope, they would freeze a lenticle of donor cornea and put an epi on the patient's cornea, keratophakia, as a lens. Here, this patient came to me. He had that surgery 20 years ago in New York. He came back. I said, Doc, he had a scar, and he was now about a minus six. And what would you do? Look at his thickness, please. It's over 800, obviously, right? Because he has. What would you do? Young guy, minus six, correctable to 20, 30 minus. Again, look at what I do, and that's what I said. Don't get scared or worried by seeing this picture. Take this giant down into a dwarf first. Here's what I want first. I want this patient's clear cornea. I want emetropia. And again, my five filters, least interventional, topical, brief, elegant, most promising vision. So I tell him, listen, your six diopters and your corneal thickness is about 800, which is because you have more tissue. I'm going to leave that tissue in place and do laser on top, because that's my way of getting your scar. And here's the best part. If it doesn't work, I'll take that other one's cornea away, then you're on your own. And I'll put an ICL. But as of now, I'm operating on someone else's cornea for you. He's like, Doc, that makes perfect sense. And am I worried about thickness at all? No. So we did laser, crystal clear cornea, patients at 20, 25 uncorrected. So use their disadvantage to their advantage. You see what I, the way I think. Yes, someone did your epicarophagia. God bless that surgeon. Don't go into who's your surgeon, what technology, where did you have it done, get me the notes. It's okay. It's okay. How do I bring him to perfect vision? Are you okay with this? Here's another patient epicarophagia. This is a faking epicarophagia because at that time there were no intraocular lenses. So this patient had an epic and you can see that it was decentered and scarred in the center. So she was miserable with her vision, 2200. What would, and she's a faking, right? What would you do? So here's a patient you can't measure because of her decentered, epic, scarred, nothing is making sense. And she's a faking, 2200 vision. What would you do? Again, let's start. Oh, sorry. Peel it off. Yes, absolutely right. Dr. Gimbal, peel it off. So to me, this is hurting us. It's in the center. It's scarred. And by the way, this was my first epic reversal. So I just went by logic. Logic. To me, logic was cornea never heals. I had never seen anyone do this. And I said, let me go ahead and do this because it cannot heal, even though she's 20 years out. So my logic, though, was what do I want here? Again, I want 20-20. Once I remove this, I have done something. I've undone her excellent surgeon's work. Now, am I ready to take her into 21st century? If I stop, I have failed too. I cannot leave her halfway. So I go in here, I made a slit, and I actually could peel this whole thing off. It came off like butter. And cornea clear. Kept her waiting for three months to refract measure. Put in a secondary lens. Again, brief, topical, aesthetically pleasing surgery. No high intervention. 2025 uncorrected. You okay? Patient with severe epithelial ingrowth in LASIK. And the patient has cataract. What would you do? See, to me, have, have you learned one thing now? I don't react to the situation at all. My goal is unshakable. I don't care what they're presenting with. My goal is unshakable. I want perfect vision, least intervention, and long-term safety. So when I look at this, I look at this, but I say, okay, this guy's only nuisance factor for me is I cannot measure her lens power accurately for cataract surgery. Are you all with me? So, I remove this, but I carefully remember this amount of epithelial ingrowth, you must take sutures. Nothing else works. I've used everything over the last 18 years. This is the best way to go. 
And, but you see the suture. Taking the suture takes less than a minute, but planning took me nearly three to four minutes per stitch. So I went against the hinge of the old LASIK that she had had elsewhere. Each stitch I was watching topographically what I'm doing, because I don't want to induce any problem. Cleared up the whole epi, put this on. Three months later, refracted her. Four months later, refracted her. Six months later, refracted her, because I wanted to see, one, is the epi in growth coming back? Second, is there ectasia? Because now I have to enter into the very sacred surgery, cataract. I don't want to go in without intelligence or accuracy. And the patient gets bewildered with, oh, really? I said, yes, you have to come back again two months later, travel back. Because I want to convince myself this is stable. Because now I had another question for me. Do I remove the stitches based on topography? But when I saw her absolutely stable, I could refract. I got a great testings on the lens uh, calculations. I said, I'm going to leave the stitches there. I'm the only one who doesn't like it when I see her on the slit lamp. But because she's stable, went in, did a toric lens cataract 2020. So she still has the stitches, does it matter? For her, we reversed her ectasia, epithelial ingrowth, got her cataract out, and she's 2020. So she loves her surgeon now who sent her over. But if you see, this is not rocket science, simple stuff. It's just a thought. Yes. Oh. That amount of with the thickness of the Yes, it was. And that's another reason why the stitch, if you see against the hinge, was a little longer. Absolutely correct. The flap does tend to melt. Dr. Gimbal is pointing to that point. Absolutely, yes. Yes, but not to the point where it was frayed. It didn't make it irregular. No, no. And that's why I kept measuring her. All those things, the irregularity, the ectasia, and the recurrence of epian growth. Because if that happens after I've done the cataract, I have done something very wrong. So that's our commitment. You have to be there to make sure you're doing the right thing at the right time. So that's that point there. Now you look at these patients. Majority of the patients who have flown to me after premium cataract surgery have the same complaint. They're not happy. The doctor, whatever, because they charge for these cases and surgery, and the patient's unhappy. Majority of the time, I don't have to remove the lens their surgeon put in. Why is that? Because I believe their surgeon did whatever best he could in the right intent. What is missing is the eye is not optically emetropic. Majority of the time, and I have the world's maybe largest practice of these kind of referrals, majority of the time is refractive errors. Something so simple. But because the doctor doesn't think of that, they put in the latest lens that they were taught at the academy. And here's my statement to that. You can't put in the best ingredient in the worst recipe. It doesn't work. It's the recipe that works. Cannot keep talking about ingredient. This is a new lens, this is a new this. That's good. But the concept has to be optically neutral. That's very important. So all these patients, if you see, again, if you see my reaction, I don't worry about what lens it is or how the eye looks. All I'm about is where are you optically? How can I make a surgeon also look good, leave the lens in place and correct the vision? So if you see, that confident level translates to RK with multifocal lenses. We have now the largest study in the world, uh, 14 years out, where I took eight patients who are all doctors, lawyers, uh, very high IQ people, and they had this surgery. But the reason for that was the confidence level, that in RK we are achieving such good results with cataract that I could put a multifocal. Are you with me? Again, remember, many, many people are taught this doesn't work, that doesn't work. That's wrong. Each patient is individual. Take them to the highest level of vision. So these patients, if you can see, you can plan it out. See the refractive error. Always correct that. So you can come back with laser. I call that new carpet over broken tiles. Laser in RK. Never do LASIK on RK, please. Wrong concept. Anatomically, physiologically, optically. Laser on RK. New carpet over broken tiles. And the brain perceives it at a great shape. Excellent vision. Patient with scars with RK, with cataract, what would you do? Come on, guys, now you've got to give me some feedback. Brilliant gentleman, PhD, with RK, with scars in the center, with cataract, what would you do? Pardon me? No, no. Take him out, please. <laughs> no, no, no. On, on John, okay. on, yeah. Lovely. So the first thing here you've got to see is 
again, I'm not reacting to how bad it looks. It looks pretty bad. Everyone agree? I'm reacting to what I want. I want 2020. I don't care how many barriers he's put in my place. I want 2020. Again, I repeat, of course, there is no such guarantee. Of course, they signed consent forms that there is no such guarantee. But in your heart, you have to aim for that. So first thing I want to do is make this cornea sensible, measurable, so I can enter the eye with accurate lens. So he's an on cornea scar on RK. So I peel the scar off. Here he is, residual scar, cataract. Wait. I measured him at three months, make sure he's stable, no recurrence, blah, blah, blah. Come in and the confidence level is so high, I put a toric lens in. And if you've seen all my presentations, publications, I always show you the patient. I, I believe, myself, I believe, that there cannot be a higher level of accountability than a patient on photo and camera, having paid for their procedure. Should I repeat that? Statements can be forged Statistics can be fudged, graphs can be made in your whatever way you want. A patient on camera will not lie. Very important. So here's where the patient started. Here he is, 2020. Back to his life. So these are important concepts I want to share with you. Again, all of you can do this. Nothing special. The point though is the thought process behind it. And no transplants ever, please. Let's go to another case. This is another PhD. This is a case of a herpetic central scar. And can you see the divot in the center? Excavated. Everybody? And I said herpes. Did you hear that? Everybody? So if you see his cornea, 13 diopters astigmatism. You can see here the scar is like a divot. Pretty thin in that area. And he has an early cataract. What would you do? Again, do I care for this? Anyone? I want 2020. That's my attitude walking in. So I don't, I don't look at this, 13 diopter astigmatism, scar, pin. What I want is, can I make his cornea sensible? Because I have to do scatrack. I call these outside in techniques. Again, I'm very simple the way I talk and teach outside in, inside out techniques. This is outside in. You want to correct the cornea so it's measurable and then you can go after the cataract more intelligently with the right lens power. So I did laser on this patient. And here he is, post laser. You can still see the scar. Six diopters astigmatism on topography. So here's the best part. He's seeing 2030 uncorrected. What is more important? His vision. He saw so well, he postponed his cataract surgery by two years. Here he is. So we first did laser and brought him in cornea scar. And you can see the improvement in vision because you'll wonder with the scar, how is he seeing? So I documented this. So we then did cataract surgery, but I did it in two stages. Because I wasn't sure of his corneal accuracy and power, I first made him aphakic, left the bag empty. And a week later, after refracting him, put in a lens. Again, it is my fight for accuracy, not his desire. He was okay with just seeing what he was seeing. 2025 uncorrected in this eye. And here's the best part. You can still see his scar. And, and did I say it's herpes? So the concept is, all this is possible. It's just how hard we want to fight with all of this patient's vision. And it's not surgically difficult at all. All of you can do it. It's just thought process has to change. Disregard the scar. Look at the impact on vision. Go for accuracy. Attack with elegant surgical techniques. Bring them to perfect vision. And of course, the patient understands that there is no guarantee. Of course, they understand transplant is their final definitive treatment. But bringing them here is what we are here for. Another case, this patient was sent from Switzerland. Uh, here she is, keratoconus, you all can see, posterior polar cataract, stigmatism of 4.3. Uh, thickness is pretty okay, 451. So what did I say? High myopia. I'm picking my pins again, guys. Do you see how I think? Posterior polar cataract, high myopia, high astigmatism, 
Kerada Konas. Young, patient. What would you do? So again here, since I have to get her posterior polar cataract, correct? Everyone agree? I can't leave that in. And it's visually affecting. Again, I want my cornea to be sensible. How do I make this keratoconic cornea sensible and stable? Good point. Cross-linking, he said. Why would you cross-link? Very good. But there's one more thing which is missing, which is why I don't like anybody cross-linking keratoconus corneas. Lovely. Let me give you this example again. Doctors excited about cross-linking, right? Hey, Mr. Smith, you have kyphosis. Everyone understands bent back, right? Kyphosis. Look at how great I am. I just came back from the academy or some nice meeting, whatever, and I've been told this is the latest cement that just got approved by FDA. I'm going to put this on your back so you don't bend anymore. How does that sound? Pretty good, right? Doctor, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're making me not bend anymore. That's amazing. You're arresting my bent back. Here's where I don't like it. Doctor, why won't you straighten my back first? So, this is bizarre that doctors are just cross-linking every k corners patient. You are maiming them forever. You're keeping them bent. Does that make sense what I just said? Correct the shape first. Laser, intact, whatever you want. And then put the cement. Keep them permanently amazing. So hence, I wouldn't cross-link this cornea at all. Because I'm after shape and accuracy and stability. So what's the next thing in my mind? Intex. I'm going to put braces into her cornea. Also shape her and decrease her astigmatism. Remember, intex can be done for astigmatism. And now the cornea is stable. I made her come back from Switzerland. Measure, measure, measure. Stability, 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 stability. Put in a toric lens in her posterior polar cataract. Always, always I call proof is the pudding, the patient. I don't want to show you any statistics, any numbers and that kind of stuff, which can be fudged. A patient is always my way. That's why all my articles, all my videos have patients at the end, because that's the highest level of accountability. So again, everybody got the plan. We did this, stabilize, remove the cataract, toric lens, 2020. Very important. Again, was this guaranteed to the patient? Never. I just told you my practice pattern, right? No advertising, no nonsense, no hype, no hype at all. This is what I think is right for you. Go home and research. Even if you come from Australia, come back again. But I will not do surgery until you understand where I'm going. And yes, all the things you read in the textbook are your backup surgeries, transplants and whatever. I will not do that. Let's fight. Get your vision. Are we okay with this guy, everybody? Let's go to another case. So here's a patient also. A number of patients are sent to me like this. Dr. Ghani, can you do the iris circlage for this patient? She has migraines, traumatic migraines with cataract. What's my reaction every time I get such a call and email? I just want to know what the patient is thinking. I tell the doctor, how do you know this pupil is not right for her? Oh, it's large from trauma and we need to make it smaller. I say, how much smaller? Yes, I have terrific skills. I can go in and make it whatever size. What size? And again, what am I always chasing? Vision. I don't want to cause iritis and circlage and a horrible looking pupil. So my first thing is, what kind of eye is this? Now I see sublux cataract, can you see the space? Now here is where I suggest femtolaser. I don't think it's great for routine cases, but for such cases you must. Made a perfect rexus in her sublux cataract, put in my toric lens where I wanted. This luckily was her non-dominant eye. And here's what I tell surgeons all the time. If you just think hard enough for the patient, you'll get very lucky. All the time. So in her non-dominant eye, I made her minus 0.75 myopic. Now she loves the fact that she can read. She doesn't see that distance so well, so she doesn't have a blur complaint at all from the pupil. I left her at that pupil. Other eye, I did a toric lens. A month later when she flew back, 2020. So now with both eyes, she's blown away. And a surgeon still asked me two years later, but Arun, when will you do her iris? I said, did the patient want it? What's the patient? The patient was thrilled. That's exactly my point. 
We are not here to do surgical acrobats and leave the patient unhappy or less than 20-20 vision. In fact, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. And that's where our profession is so fun, so uh, privileged we are to do what we do. So that's the other concept there. Now here's a case. Quickly, I'll show you what I call, uh, you all heard me, some of you didn't uh, come in on time for the start. I tell the patient, eye surgery is just my excuse to manipulate your brain. I'm after your brain. I want your maximum optics. So that's important. Now look at this case. She has scars on both sides, right? High astigmatism, if you see her, seven diopters and cataract. Now here's the, again, the patient personal scenario. She could not travel back to me. She had trouble traveling back. She's a very busy professor, etc. all that stuff. So I said, here's what I'll do. I put in a toric lens and flipped her astigmatism axis. And because the VizX works on the flat axis, I then did laser. Patient straight to emetropia. In other words, we avoided the two surgeries of the scar. And still did what she needed, cataract. But in a, such an intelligent way that she went back home, 2020. So we're manipulating the optics all the time. I am never happy when surgeons send me their video and tell me, Arun, I did this vitrectomy and I stitched the lens. I said, that's okay. What's the patient's vision? I always have one question only. What's the patient's vision? I don't want to see anything else. If the patient is seeing 2020, I don't want to know what you did. Here's another case to summarize. Patient sent to me by an excellent surgeon. Scarred cornea, you can all see. She'd had multifocal restore lens. And because the surgeon landed with a hyperopic surprise, the surgeon attempted LASIK and then PRK two times, three times, ended up with high hyperopia plus 5.25, minus 1.25, 180, 2200 vision. Patient frustrated, wanting to sue the surgeon. What would you do? And also, also she did a yak capsulotomy, so the bag is open. What would you do? So I showed you all a case where we first put the lens inside for that pilot and then corrected the cornea. Because the cornea was steep, I wanted to flatten it. But here, I have no idea about a cornea. That much scarring is going on. Yes, scarring is going on, right? So what we did is we lasered the cornea, cleared the scar, made the cornea intelligent. Now I could actually measure where her landing was from her surgeon, refractive. See the topography here? and measured her to plus six diopters to 2025 vision. Now, she has a clear cornea. She has a lens multifocal restore with an open bag and she's plus six. What would you do? Excellent, absolutely. So we piggyback on this. Again, remember brief, topical, aesthetically pleasing surgery. Bring us straight to 2020. The, the star lens, the piggyback lens. Piggyback. Uh -huh. the star. The star, yes. Yeah. So again, if you see the concepts by topography and pentacam, you can see the impact. Summary. Again, brief, brief, topical, aesthetically pleasing, visually uh, maximizing our end point. So with that, I end the, the talk and thank you for your attention.